fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Uh, today we have um, an author of, uh, I guess, horror science fiction sort of thing. Uh, I, I'm not even sure. Um, so joining us on the line is Mr. Greg Hickey. Thank you for being here. Hi, Alan. Thank you very much for having me. Well, uh, so Greg, um, you've written, it looks like you're on your fourth book now. Um, tell us a little bit about your history so people kind of know who, who you are. Sure. So I grew up um, in the suburbs north of Chicago, um, lived there pretty much all my life, uh, grew up Playing sports, um, got interested in writing around seventh grade, and um, I remember that was around the time we were starting to get assigned to write stories for class, you know, longer, multi-page stories with trying to develop a plot and everything. Um, and I wrote this story for my seventh grade English class that was about um, a cruise liner that gets shipwrecked on a desert island, and the passengers all have to kind of figure out how to survive and not kill each other. Um, and I, I enjoyed the experience, and you know, my teacher liked the story, and either I or my teacher read it for the class, I think my classmates seemed to like it. So I thought, well, you know, I, I like this writing thing, so over the summer I'm going to turn this short story into a novel. Um, so, you know, first day of summer break, I went down to my parents' basement and sat down in front of our old Macintosh computer and, and started typing, and I would guess probably by that afternoon I decided I had enough and I wanted to go outside and play with my friends, and so that novel never really got off the ground. Um, but it was, it was something I realized I enjoyed early on, and I thought I would want to pursue it. So um, I took a creative writing class in high school, went off to college in Southern California, um, kept playing sports. I played baseball in college, and when it was time for me to graduate from college, I didn't really have a plan for what I was going to do next. And so in the last couple of weeks of my senior, senior year, a baseball coach approached me and said he was in contact with a team in Sweden that was looking for an American to come over and be a player coach for their team for the summer. So having nothing better to do and realizing this was you know, a wonderful opportunity to be a different part of the world and continue playing baseball, I jumped the chance. And a week after graduation, I was on a plane to Stockholm and then on a train up north to a town called Sundsvall. So I spent the summer in Sinsaw, Sweden, um, playing and coaching for a local baseball team. And my responsibilities for that team were basically limited to um, coaching and participating in the adult team's practices and games. So I played two practices a week and then two games, usually a doubleheader on either Saturday or, Saturday or Sunday. Um, and then I would coach uh, a 16 and under team during the week, probably for maybe one or two practices during the week and then the occasional game or tournament on the weekend. So I had a lot of time to myself, especially during weekdays, and I decided that this time I was really going to sit down and, and write my first novel. Um, so I got to work, uh, made pretty good use of my time in Sunsal, and by the time I got home, um, I had about half of the draft of what would become my first novel. Uh, after Sunsal, I had another opportunity to go and play baseball with a team in, in Cape Town, South Africa. So I returned home from Sundsvall, Sweden, to Chicago in September of the year I graduated, uh, September 2008. In October, I was on a plane to Cape Town, South Africa, to kind of continue my baseball odyssey. Um, when I was in South Africa, again, a fairly um, limited baseball responsibilities and, and playing opportunities, uh, at least compared to, you know, a, a American professional schedule or even a American college schedule. I had a part-time job for a while in Cape Town, but other than that, I did still have a lot of opportunities to continue writing. So by the time I returned from Cape Town in April of 2009, I had the first draft of 
that was my first novel. Um, so I kept that after that. Um, in 2009, I enrolled at graduate school and started a graduate program in forensic science. Kept writing throughout grad school, continued writing after I took a job with the Illinois State Police in a forensic science laboratory, uh, which is where I still work today, it's still my day job. Um, I continued writing throughout, so at this point, I'm about to release my third novel, which is entitled Parabellum, um, coming out in October of 2020. And Terrible is a little bit more of a, a crime novel, which is different than some of my previous works. Hmm. Well, you know, when you um, say you were forensic science, like in college, and you do that for the um, police department, um, what's your draw to writing? Like, what is it exactly that um, you feel you want to accomplish when you write? Because it's so different. Yes, definitely. Um, and I, I think I kind of enjoy that difference. You know, I, um, I grew up in a family with two parents who got master's degrees in business or finance. Um, a brother who was also very mathematically inclined and ended up getting a master's degree in finance. Um, and I just, ne for whatever reason, never fit in with those interests. So I was always interested in, in science and creative pursuits and, and trying out different things and, and seeing what I liked. Um, so what I, what I like about forensic science is that it, it's a really concrete application of science. So, you know, about puzzle solving and using science to um, try to solve crimes and using science to help out the criminal justice system. So it's a very easy, direct application of scientific principles. Um, and so that's kind of a way to keep me grounded. And then the balance of that is right where I get to explore different ideas and kind of, you know, Whereas in forensics, I'm taking evidence and following it to one specific direction. In writing, that that following and t looking at different ideas kind of opens up, and you explore ideas on a wider spectrum. Um, I, I would think so that it's, it's something I wouldn't that be kind ahead. of a a conflict in a sense because when you're writing, um, you're using your imagination, and it's and it's not the same same structure or rules that say there is to a forensic like when you're doing something at work there is rules there's definite fact and non-fact there's definite evidence and non so when you're writing you're not writing that you're not writing about forensic science or or policing you're writing about more of a f science fiction fantasy sort of thought so how how do you get that um, how do you get the structure in your writing? Sure. So I, I think in, you know, one sense they are very different and one is kind of a break from the other. So, you know, exercising my creative, creative side of my brain is a little bit of a break from exercising the more concrete, practical side of my brain. Um, and, and I enjoy having that balance. You know, I've never been someone who can just, um, do one thing to the exclusion of all other things. I enjoy the balance of being a little bit more practical and analytical and being a little bit more creative and exploratory. Um, but I would say as a writer, for the most part, I tend to steer towards the kind of uh, practical nuts and bolts side of writing. So, you know, writers often talk about either being planners or pantsers, or planners being writers who make very detailed outlines beforehand, before writing a story, you know, set down everything that's going to happen scene by scene, work out the arc of each character throughout the story, and really have a very clear plan of what's going to happen before they actually sit down to write full sentences and, and knock out the story. Um, contrast that with cancers, um, which comes from the term, you know, fly by the seat of your pants. Uh, cancers will just sit down and go, just start writing, um, whatever comes to mind, you know, put down characters and, and plot lines as they kind of occur and sort of see where the story takes them. And then, you know, if something needs to be fixed, they can go back later on and, and iron out any issues. Um, so as a writer, I'm definitely naturally a planner. You know, I, I like to have a, a clear plot for my story. I like to know where the story, story's going beforehand. Um, I think that makes it easier for me to kind of fill in holes. So if I'm writing and working from a plan, if I get to a point where I'm stuck, I can go back to the plan and be like, okay, you know, here's where I need to get to. How do 
I get there? Can I break this down in smaller steps in my outline? Uh, so instead of going from A to G, I can go from A to B, B to C, C to D, and so forth, and get to where I need to go without having to, you know, jump and make big leaps in, in the story. Um, I was going to say, so Parabellum, the story, where does it come from? The, the story itself? Yeah. Like, how did you create um, the story? Like, where did where did it come from for you? Sure. So, the idea itself, um, and I'll back up and say, Parabellum is about a fictional mass shooting that occurs in my hometown in Chicago. Um, and then it follows four characters who might be involved in the shooting and investigate how and why each, each person might be involved. And the impetus really came from um, the continued spate of mass shootings that have occurred in, in the United States in the past 20 or so years, um, but really the uh, Sandy Hook shooting in 2012. And that really got me thinking, you know, why does this keep happening? What's going on in the minds of these mass murderers? Because it seems like there's something different going on in, in the mind of someone who would walk into a school or walk into a nightclub and just open fire on a bunch of strangers versus even, you know, think of a, a typical serial killer that we imagine stalking his, um, his victims and, you know, having this routine and, and this sort of um, almost ceremonial right to the killing. You know, something at least that I can wrap my head around what's going on there and we have these terms like the thrill of the hunt and we understand routine and, and, you know, and ceremony, but it's more puzzling to me to explain what's going on with someone who just randomly um, fires a gun into a crowd of people with no particular aim other than just to kill as many people as possible. So I wanted to kind of get to the bottom of what was going on in these issues and try to explore it through, through a fictional story that, hopefully entertaining to readers but also got to the to the heart of some of these issues so now you're four people that you've sort of chosen as your possible suspects uh, how did you come up with those four characters um like what made you choose like you've got a computer programmer and you've got a ex-college athlete that uh has been hit in the head several times um an army vet turned cop, and of course uh, a high school student. Uh, how did you come up with those four themes? So, in order to write this book, I wanted to make sure that I was, you know, being factually accurate as to the types of people that were capable of committing mass violence, and then the sort of symptoms and, and psychological conditions. Um, of, of these people and being accurate to what was going on in their minds. So I did a lot of research on conditions like psychopathy, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, and try to figure out, you know, what's going on in these conditions. And then I also did a lot of research into historical mass shootings and, and accounts of, of evil and wrongdoing, so reading books like uh, Dave Columbine, Dave Cullen's account of the Columbine High School shooting, um, Masters of Death by Richard Rhodes, which is a historical account of Nazi extermination squads. Um, so those books gave me a framework for how a person could become this sort of indiscriminate killer. And then within each of those frameworks, um, there's a, some different uh, psychological profiles that emerge. And I tried to take a few of those psychological profiles, and then apply them to characters in the story. So, on these four characters, do you think it's um, do you, how do I say it? Do you think it's as simple as just the person themselves, or do you also include some of the societal uh, things around them? Uh, like, and I mean that in the sense of, um, f for instance, the U.S. has. A, a lot more of these shootings than anywhere else in the world, in particular. Um, so is there something societal as well that you include? Absolutely, um, and, and on several levels. So um, I think it's always kind of a, 
an interplay between what's going on with the person, him or herself, and what's going on with the external factors that influence that person. Um, so, for example, a person who is depressed, you know, there's obviously bio biochemical changes in that person's brain, but there's also stuff going on in that person's life that influences the individual's mood. So it's not just that you know, these biochemical changes in the individual's brain, but the individual encounters disappointments, setbacks, et cetera, over the course of their life. And while their brain state might influence how they respond to those setbacks, um, they're also, you know, they're not made up. They are encountering issues in the world. And at the same time, as you touched on, you know, these issues, these shootings do occur more often in the United States than in other countries. So there are also social factors there. You know, the ease in which a person can acquire a firearm in the United States is a big social factor. Um, the state of mental health care in the United States is another big social factor. Um, whether, you know, whether it's, and there are pros and cons to all the arguments about mental health care, firearms access, et cetera, but they are issues and they do play a role in, in mass shootings and in other crimes. When you when you got these characters, the four people, how did you how what did you draw from to get their personality? So when you've got the computer programmer, um, do you take personalities and 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 um, things from people you've met, or people you work with, or family, or someone you've seen in a coffee shop? Is there something that you draw from to develop that character? Um, I guess all of the above. In this case, um, for the four main characters in Parabellum, a lot of them are kind of based on little parts of my personality. Um, so I would say that none of the four characters is exactly like me, um, but they all have little pieces of things that I've experienced or personal personality traits that I have, and then they're kind of extended into entirely different people. So, for example, there's uh, one character who is a career soccer player. Um, she gets a scholarship to play soccer at University of California, Berkeley. Um, you know, she's got plans to play four years in college, you know, keep her scholarship, uh, study anatomy and science, and eventually go to physical therapy school and become a physical therapist and so forth. Uh, and that all changes when she has a series of head injuries that force her to step away from the sport and, and return home to Chicago and kind of not only deal with the memory and cognitive issues that she's having, but also figure out how she's going to move forward with her life. And, you know, can she even go back to school? Does she need to find a part-time job? How, how reliant is she going to be on her parents and her family? Um, and so, you know, I've never experienced severe head injuries. I don't have chronic, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, but, you know, I did have that experience, like I mentioned earlier. I was traveling around the world playing baseball, um, playing baseball in college at a pretty high level, and then coming back home and realizing, you know, this is not a stable career. I can't continue to, you know, I wasn't making enough money in Sweden South, or South Africa where I was going to make a living playing, playing baseball was never good enough to play professional baseball in the United States. Um, so I had to kind of set that part of my life aside and figure out what I was going to do next. Um, so for me, in, in writing the characters and in, in writing the ex-athlete character in particular, it was a matter of taking my experience as an athlete and as an athlete, you know, coming to grips with the end of my baseball career, um, and then extending that into another character who's, you know, even, an even better athlete than me, whose athletic career is even more, even a bigger part of their identity, and having that character, you know, face the crisis where they can no longer play a sport that's really become part of their identity. And that's quite unusual to choose a woman as a mass shooter, too, because I, I, has that really happened in the U.S.? Um. I don't know if there are, I mean, there's certainly a minority of mass shooters. Um, and then, you know, the more well-known shooting all involve males. Um, I do believe there are some that involve females. And, um, you know, I, I, maybe 
I don't know if the motivations differ from male to female, but um, they are certainly a minority of mass shootings in the United States. Yeah, and that's kind of what I figured. So that would be kind of a, um unusual choice, I think. Um, and it's, it, it, I think it's more in the manner of the way females kill as compared to males, the, the type of style they choose. Um, usually don't hear about that, but that's that's interesting. Yeah, and I wanted to, you know, make the characters somewhat diverse. You know, one because I think it's a boring story if the characters are all, you know, four white males of roughly the same age. Right. Um, but also, you know, even though females may be a minority of, of mass shooters um, and so forth, I think it's important to realize that the issues that sort of surround violence and crime in the United States or in any country do affect everyone, you know, regardless of gender, regardless of race. Yeah, they are four fascinating choices for potential uh, shooters. So it's 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 quite a an interesting thread to unpack as things go along. He missed radio show talk host. <laughs> Uh, that's me. Um, we can't get it together to even record on time sometimes. So yeah, that's right. I tell you, get my gun. Uh, do you do you have a? Uh, is there an underlying theme or something you want people to get out of reading the book, other than the story? Um, I mean, I, I really, you know, the story is important, but I do think a lot of the book is about. Um, empathy and, and failures of empathy. So for me, you know, what I found in reading all these stories of historical mass shootings and accounts of different psychologies is that mass shootings differ from other killings like gang warfare, or heat of passion murders, uh, revenge, uh, something that extends out of a, a robbery or other crime. Um, and mass shootings are really an extreme example of a crime that's due to a failure of empathy. Um, so in order to, you know, shoot up a beach full of people, you have to have an extreme failure of empathy where you don't even see the individuals on that beach as human beings. And that could be due to, you know, personal narcissism. It could be due to, to, to ignorance. It could be due to um, some sort of psychosis or other dissociation from reality. Um, and for me, you know, writing Parabellum was both a way to War empathy and, and the lack of empathy, but also it was an exercise in empathy for myself because I was trying to figure out how I could understand each of these characters and what they were going through and help the reader understand them as well. Um, while at the same time not condoning what they eventually do and not condoning their journey towards violence. Um, and so part of the, I guess, theme of Parabellum is that you know, trying to solve these problems in the world, whether it's mass shootings or violence or crime or, or anything else, often begins with us kind of looking inward and saying, you know, how can I be a better person and how can I better understand what people around me are dealing with um, so that I can either help them or I can help myself to, you know, be a better person in the world. I was, I'm wondering, did you involve a character like Alex Jones where they were saying it's fake? <laughs> No, there's there is no uh, fake news kind of person, um, <laughs> and you know I, <laughs> I early on I toyed with the idea of having a sort of sensationalist reporter in there who was um, covering a mass shooting and, and sort of aggrandizing what was going on uh, because I do think that a lot of times the way mass shootings have been covered in the past um, sort of lends itself to, I won't say copycat crimes, but it lends itself to people who might be capable of committing such crimes, seeing the um, attention given to shooters and realizing that, that that would appeal to them. So a lot, you know, you'll see mass shootings covered with, you know, you'll see the shooter's name and picture, um, you'll have running tallies of the number of victims, you'll see headlines like, you know, biggest mass shooting in the United States, and so forth. Um, and instead of focusing too much on the on the shooters, 
I wanted to shift my focus a little bit towards in part the victims, but also what's going on with the shooters, you know, not aggrandizing their actions, but trying to understand what could drive someone to commit such an action. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I also toyed with this character who was sort of a stereotypical media person who was, you know, covering crime scenes and live tweeting the aftermath of a mass, mass shooting. Um, but then I've ultimately decided that this reporter character didn't fit in with the, the way I wanted to tell the story, um, didn't fit in with the timeline of the story. So she ended up getting, getting cut out of the story. She got shot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a really interesting idea. Um, do you, how do you feel like you're, what do you think the feedback will be like on something like this? Um, so far, it's been generally positive. You know, I've sent it out to, to readers and to uh, reviewers for advanced reviews. Um, and I would say it's generally been positive. Um, and so hopefully that continues. Uh, I think all, readers have been... Uh, generally uh, praiseworthy worthy about both the story itself and the sort of suspense crime fiction aspect of it and the, the message of, you know, trying to understand what's going on in the mind of a person capable of committing violence. So, you know, it's been a very encouraging so far to see that sort of the two threads that I was trying to pull together um, have hit with readers and hit with some diverse readers who have, uh, different interests in their reading tape. Yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Do you, do you draw your ideas from other things as well? Like what what influences you outside of writing and your work? Like what kind of things? Um, so do you mean what influences my writing? Yeah, or, like what do you, what do you think you draw from that gives you some sort of influence? Besides, is is it other writers? Is it uh, um, movies? Let's say, or or um, what kind of things do you draw on? I would say my ideas for a, a story almost always come from something else I've read. So it could be another piece of fiction. It could be. Um, you know, a, a scientific paper, it could be a piece of news. Um, but I think my influence has always come from taking an idea that I've read somewhere and then thinking about, okay, how can I extend this idea? What are, what are the consequences of this idea? If it's true, um, what's another way I can twist this idea so it goes in a different direction and, and develops into what I think is a compelling story? So you, are you going to continue now at, with this kind of a theme, like a science fiction sort of horror um, crime sort of mix? Uh, are you going to? Do you think you'll continue writing that way? Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't plan to write another novel, at least at the moment, that's you know in the exact same genre as Parabellum. Um, so of the, of the three novels I've written now, the first one, Our Dread Voices, is, I would guess, I would call it dystopian fiction. Um, the second novel, The Friar's Lantern, is, uh, you know, general or literary fiction, but it has aspects of crime fiction and science fiction as well. Uh, Parabellum, same, in a similar vein, is sort of literary general fiction, but again, with aspects of mystery and suspense and crime fiction. Um, so one of the things that, I like about sort of genre fiction um, and science fiction is a really good example is that it's a good way to explore different ideas in the guise of fiction. So one of the nice things about, you know, science fiction is that you can ask questions like, well, what if this technology was developed? You know, what kind of consequences would that have for society? What positives would it be? What negatives would there be? Um, what are some things that, you know, no one's even thinking about? And, you know, in a similar vein with science fiction, you can say, okay, you know, Here's a problem with crime in society. What's really at the heart of that that issue? Um, how can we unpack it? How can we um, try to, you know, not remedy it, but at least move the conversation forward about some of those issues? Um, and at the same time, you know, obviously in fiction, you're trying to tell a compelling story, and so it's I think important for me to have those ideas in there and ask some 
some larger questions, but also keep the reader entertained and keep the reader kind of coming back for more and being willing to explore those ideas um, in a fictional story. So, so what does Greg do when you when he's got writer's block, or he's sort of stuck, or you're at a place where you're you've got part of a story written, but you can't seem to pick up the pieces and continue it? So, I'll do one of two things. Um, one is that I'll just put that part of the story aside and write a different part, a part that seems to come easier to me. Um, if I'm absolutely convinced that I want to finish that section of the story and I you know, don't want to start anything else until I get it done, um, going for a walk almost always helps cure my writer's block. Um, there's, I think, been some research showing that walking, especially walking outside, improves creativity. And I've, in my experience, I found that to be true. So if I do have writer's block and if I'm working out, I'll usually take my phone, go outside for a walk, and as ideas start to come to me, I'll just type them down in a note-taking app on my phone and then come back to my computer and, you know, copy and paste everything back into the documents I'm working on. So that, that's, that's interesting. So let's see. So when things are really kind of hard, like, you know, the way things are right now with all the um, the COVID and the... And, um, the um, police shootings and protests and uh, the election and all this sort of stuff going on. When things like that are going on around you, do you find it difficult to write, or does it does it make you write even darker? Because um, you, you're writing kind of a dark story. Um, does this sort of help your writing? Um, you know, I don't know that it does have an influence one way or the other. Um, well, I've always kind of written stories that sort of touch on contemporary issues. I'm usually not as inspired to write about the big issues of the day. And I, maybe that's because I, I read a fair amount about them. You know, I'm, I don't read every piece of news, but I consider myself fairly well informed. Um, and a lot of times it seems like, you know, and I'm, not, I'm not inspired to write a story about, let's say, COVID-19 because I keep reading so much about COVID-19, I'm not sure that I have anything new to say. Um, versus, you know, I've read a fair amount about mass shootings, but every time one happens, it still seems like people are asking, what's going on? Why does this happen? Um, so, yeah, and while I think the big issues of the day are certainly important and I think there are people who are um, doing enough writing about it and do, providing enough quality content that I probably haven't felt the urge necessarily to weigh in with my own fiction on those subjects. Yeah, but I wonder if, if being around it contributes to the way you feel and that contributes to the way you write. Like, like if there's something really sure, yeah. dark happening around, like it's not all, uh, you know, cherries and roses, uh, but things are kind of rough. Does that? I wonder if that contributes to your to your darkness if you write. Um, again, I would probably say no. And th I mean, the reason I say that is I started writing Carabellum, I mean, really sitting down and getting to work in 2016, 2017. Mm. So you know, well, I was certainly inspired by mass shootings had, had occurred before that time, um, but I finished writing Claire Bellman in you know, 2019, early 2020, which was before, you know, COVID and COVID-19 even hit the United States, um, obviously not before the onset of institutional racism, but at least before George Floyd and Breonna, Breonna Taylor and so forth. Um, so in one part, you know, issues that were experiencing now in October 2020 weren't at least prominent issues when I first started to write Parabellum. Um, so I was responding to something that was darker in the past, but the novel, when it comes out this month, isn't responding to darkness that's occurring this year. Right, right. Well, that's pretty interesting. Did you have a favorite author? Um, 
I, I do kind of like authors that do what I aspire to do, which is kind of weave some bigger ideas into into fiction and especially sort of genre fiction. So you know, I like George Orwell, I like 1984, I like other Camus, The Plague, and, and novels like that that are kind of exploring some bigger ideas about you know the way the world works and humans' place in it and how humans should act, but then weave those into some pretty compelling stories. Hmm. Wow. Uh, so now, do you have your own website that people can go and find you and find out more about you? I do. Uh, it's gregkickywrites.com. So my name and then writes W-R-I-T-E-S dot com. So now, um, is the book out yet or will it be out? Um, yeah, it'll be out. I'm guessing by the time this interview goes live, it'll be out on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and the usual places. Fantastic. Well, it's certainly been uh, interesting to hear um, kind of your process in the book. Uh, we've been talking to Greg Hickey, and his new book, Parabellum, will be out this month. We're going to have it linked up on our website as well as his, so people listening can find it real easy. Um, well, Greg, thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been my pleasure. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll tell you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.